Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's research seminar series. My name is Alisa, and I'm the program coordinator for the BC Brain Wellness Program, and will be serving as your MC for today's event. We're joined today by Dr. Lara Boyd and Dr. Anya Shoshankui, very special guests who will be discussing opera and its various impacts on the brain and cognition. Before we get started, I would like to first acknowledge that the BC Brain Wellness Program at the Javed Moafasian Centre for Brain Health is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam peoples. I'm joining you today from Vancouver, the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As all of you are joining from different places today, I encourage us all to take a moment to reflect and give thanks to the land where we're privileged to work, learn, and play from. I would also like to take a moment to thank all of our program donors for supporting the BC Brain Wellness Program. Because of your generosity, we're able to provide these educational events in our online classes. As an entirely donor-funded program, we rely on your generosity to ensure the continuation and development of our program. So thank you so much for your ongoing support. In today's discussion, we embark on an intriguing journey through the world of neuroscience and music, guided by the expertise of Dr. Lara Boyd and Dr. Anya Shoshankui. The presentation will begin by offering comprehensive overview of the profound and enchanting impact of music on the human brain. We'll explore how melodies, rhythms, and harmonies have the power to shape our cognitive and emotional experiences, leaving an indelible mark on our neural pathways. Moving beyond this exploration of music's influence, we'll delve into the recent research that sheds light on the captivating realm of opera and its effect on brain function and cognition. Through a harmonious blend of scientific insights and artistic intrigue, the discussion promises to unveil the intricate interplay between music, brain, opera, providing a deeper understanding of how these art forms resonate within the very core of our neurological and cognitive landscapes. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. If you have any questions for our presenters today, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them towards the end uh, of the Q&A session. To keep everything streamlined, only the presenters and the MC will be unmuted for today's session on Zoom. As well, this session is being recorded and the recording will be available to you on our website at bcbrainwellness.ca in about two weeks time, if you'd like to rewatch or share with friends and family. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speakers, Dr. Lara Boyd, who's a physical therapist and neuroscientist at the University of British Columbia, where she's a professor and a world scholar. She's an expert in neurobiology of learning and uses advanced brain imaging approaches to look into the brain. Dr. Boyd's research is centered on understanding how behavior shapes learning, unlearning, and relearning. She has published more than 180 scientific papers in her TEDx talk, After This, Your Brain Will Not Be the Same, has over 30 million views. Our second speaker is Dr. Anya Shoshankui. Anya is an assistant professor at the Department of Musicology at the University of Vienna. After completing a PhD in psychology at Queen's University with Dr. Lola Cuddy, she joined the Peter Wall Opera Project as a SSHRC postdoctoral fellow, working with Nancy Germston, Dr. Janet Worker, and Dr. Laura Boyd. Her research interest is the perception and cognition of music, particularly as it intersects with the perception and cognition of language and their neural signatures. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Boyd and Dr. Kui. Welcome. And we also see this in another brain area called the internal capsule, which is where a lot of the descending outputs from the motor areas of the brain are going through the midbrain on down out to the spinal cord and out to make help us make movements. So we understand that the more you practice, the more elaborate these structures are. We also think that musical training may actually enhance our capacity for neuroplasticity. And I'll just show you a couple examples of this. So um, this is a study from Herholz showing that musicians, when they compare them to non-musicians, and these again are, are pianists, that um, they are faster, they show faster neural encoding or faster learning of a new sound, of a new regularity in sound. Um, and they see this within an area called the auditory, um, secondary auditory cortex. But you see this rapidity with which a musician can acquire and learn a new melody or a new um, set of sounds. What also I think is really interesting about this study is that musicians, as compared to non-musicians, also show um, smaller sensory maps. So that means that they're able to detect when you touch them with two stimuli, 
They have a lower threshold, so they detect those stimuli faster, easier. And they also seem to have a more excitable motor cortex. And that's what's being shown over here. So this is a, a test where you look to see um, the difference when you evoke an electromagnetic potential on the motor area, do you get a larger response in the musicians than you do in the non-musicians? So it's telling us that somehow music is fun, musical training is fundamentally changing the way the brain is able to change in response to stimuli. And it turns out that these changes may also be somewhat neuroprotective. And so when I say neuroprotective, I mean that if something then happens to your brain as we age, then people with musical training may be more capable to adapt to that change than people who are not trained as musicians. So this is again comparing older musicians with older non-musicians and showing that people who with musical training again are better at encoding or learning new auditory sounds. This one's really important. They're better at complex auditory processing so they can better perceive speech in a noisy environment. <clears throat> that particular finding <clears throat> is very important for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> one, because we know that not hearing well is a definite um, a risk factor for dementia. So the better able to be able to perceive speech in a noisy environment may be protecting you against that risk. <clears throat> and then lastly, it turns out that people with musical training have better auditory working memory, which means when they hear something, they're better at remembering it. So taken together, it's a pretty powerful argument um, for why musical training is pretty important. So what is musical training maybe doing to the brain at kind of a basic level? Um, it does a couple things. One of the most basic things that music does is it increases blood flow to the brain. And so when you increase blood flow, you can then support increased brain activity. And we also see from that increased blood flow that there's an increase in what we call brain growth factors. So these are chemicals in the brain that help to make the brain more neuroplastic, more easily able to adapt to a new stimuli. Another thing that seems to be a downstream effect of music in the brain is through this particular pathway, through the hypothalamus, um, to the pituitary gland, to the adrenal cortex, with the net result being that when we listen to music, we see reductions in our stress hormone, and that's cortisol. So we see overall impact of cortisol going down in response to having interacted with music. Now, why do you care about having you know, your stress hormone go down? So cortisol actually is something that we have, we're expressing normally throughout our day. And actually having too little cortisol is not a good thing. You're kind of difficult to arouse, you have low motivation. But having too much cortisol is very negative, And that's something that many of us suffer from. Um, for too, too much cortisol leads to anxiety, memory impairments. Um, and so what we wanna have is just the right amount of cortisol. When you have just the right amount of cortisol as you would in this inverted U when you're up here, this is gonna have positive effects on memory, on immunity, on pain sensitivity. And so this, um, this thinking that music may actually help us push down cortisol may give us a mechanism, a tool by which if we're feeling anxious, we're feeling like we're kind of flooded with anxiety and maybe too much cortisol, we might be able to use music to push it back to a more normal state. So it can be thought of almost as an intervention. Um, and many of us may already kind of know that intuitively and have done this through our lives. Um, but this may be one of those reasons why music is so very powerful and has these health effects. So to kind of wrap all that up, engaging with music, it appears to change our brain structure and, our, and its function. It can change blood flow in the brain, improve it. It can decrease our stress hormone cortisol and then increase the brain growth factors that help our brain be neuroplastic. So together, when you put all that together, it may directly and positively affect brain health. So with all of that in mind, we um, have worked with our colleagues, um, Dr. Or Dr. Janet Worker in psychology, and Professor Nancy Hermiston, who directs the UBC opera program, is also the director of voice at UBC. And this um, work was very uh, generously funded by the Peter Wall um, Institute and the Wall family. And what we're really interested in understanding is what are the links between artistic training, in this instance, opera, with learning and brain health. So we have kind of two main aims of this study. The first one is looking at the effect of opera training, and these are UBC students engaging in opera training, very intense opera training, and what's that effect on learning, memory, and executive function? 
We're not really going to talk about those data today. Um, we have talked about them at other times. Um, we're going to hear focus today on what's opera training doing to the brain. And so we think that it's going to change brain function and structure. And we hope that then those changes are going to relate positively back to changes um, in our behavior and learning. So just as a quick overview um, to remind everyone how just crazy complicated opera is. So opera is a very complicated classical performing art. So when you're engaging with opera, when you're an, an opera performer, those individuals are singing, they're acting, they're dancing, they're paying attention to a conductor, they're paying attention to their other performers on the stage, often a big ensemble, and they're probably doing it in a second language. And it's probably not a second language they speak. So they could be doing this opera and everything from Czechoslovakian to the classic Italian operas um, to Finnish, German, um, you name it. And so when you put all that together, it's in a massively complex art form. And these uh, people who can perform it are doing a really amazing thing and they're doing it all at the same time. So it has this very high cognitive load. And so that's something that we think is maybe particularly important about opera itself. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. I'm going to turn it over to um, Anya, and we're going to um, look at some of our brain imaging data. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Laura, for your introduction. Um, I'm going to take over from here and show you some of our first findings and future directions of the Peter Wall Opera project that Laura just introduced. Um, and for some of the results that I'm showing you here, uh, these are so new that Lara hasn't even seen them yet, so you're, um, you're getting the first look. All right, um, so I, I should also mention that, of course, this work doesn't happen in isolation, and the work that I'm presenting today uh, is a fruits of labor from many hands, including Negin Yegane, Motamed Yegane, who is the other postdoc on this project, uh, Sarah Koitna, who is at uh, UBC Okanagan, Olga Kapinska, also from the University of Vienna, and um, as Laura mentioned, Nancy Hermiston and Janet Worker. I'm going to start by talking a bit about structural and functional brain connectivity changes through our training. So why do we care about brain connectivity? Uh, by knowing how our brain communicates um, with itself, uh, how different brain areas communicate with each other, uh, we get a measure of basically how, um, yeah, how the brain functions. It is basically a mirror of uh, what the brain does. And uh, Lara has already mentioned fractional anisotropy as a measure of brain connectivity. Um, that is a particular measure of brain connectivity that uh, derives from diffusion tensor imaging and which we can use to get a structural image of brain connectivity. There is also a way of looking at brain connectivity uh, by studying co-activations in the brain. Uh, we do this using resting state uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, so that by looking at uh, which brain areas are active at the same time in a similar manner, we also get an idea of which brain areas may be communicating with each other. Uh, so again, as Lara mentioned, we know from past literature, uh, the comparisons of uh, diffusion tensor imaging data between musicians and non-musicians have revealed uh, differences in this um, structural uh, measure. Um, in different white matter tracts, uh, including, for example, the arcuate vesiculus, which I will refer to later again as well. But we also see differences between musicians and non musicians um, in their co activations, so in their resting state uh, functional brain connectivity. And this greater uh, co activation happens between motor and multisensory areas, and as well as areas associated with cognitive functions such as memory and language. And uh, Laura has already mentioned all of the things that opera singers need to be doing and need to take into account while they're on stage, so this certainly uh, makes sense as well. Um, there are very few longitudinal studies which exist to corroborate the idea that music training is really the thing that changes our brain rather than different brain um, structural and functional characteristics predicting whether you will have an interest in music or not. Uh, but we do see these data. 
And so this is why the Peter Wall Opera project is so important because it provides us an opportunity to really see what happens over um, a certain period of time. So our overall question then is, does long-term training change structural and functional brain connectivity in adults? And um, in the Peter Wall Opera project, we use uh, this a very specific and highly trained sample of opera students uh, because they engage in all sorts of very interesting types of training of which we know or of which we suspect that they will have an effect on brain connectivity. And what I'm presenting you here first um, is a bit of pilot data that we collected at the very beginning of our project where we looked at uh, changes that occur within a very short period of time um, uh, in the case of 15 participants. So these 15 students were participating in an opera workshop. What does that mean? Uh, as part of the workshop, these students rehearse four days a week for seven weeks. And when I say four days a week, I mean very much that they are basically there the entire day to rehearse. They work together with the director and the conductor, um, as well as a collaborative pianist at the orchestra, and then they perform in front of a paying audience. So this is truly a very intense dose of working as an opera singer, and it is one of the main components of the UBC opera program. And what we did was get uh, some brain imaging data both before and after this opera workshop took place. Um, there are a lot of numbers on here in case you're interested. Later we can look at them in more detail. Um, and then we looked at their structural and functional brain connectivity. So uh, for the structural connectivity, we looked at um, their connectivity before and after the workshop and looked at which part of their white matter skeleton showed the most change. And in the functional connectivity analysis, we looked at where um, we see significant changes in the co-activation after the workshop for particular regions of interest based on the available cross-sectional literature. These are the results from the structural analysis. Uh, so in green, we see the mean white matter skeleton. So this is um, a map of where we see white matter across all of our 15 participants. And this mean white matter skeleton looks pretty much very similar for all of us. And in blue and in red, I have marked regions in which we see changes after the, uh, after the opera workshop. And in blue, in dark blue, for example, we see the left posterior limb of the internal capsule. And the internal capsule, if you may remember, was already a brain region that Lara mentioned um, as one that's very important in the white matter skeleton. And we also see changes in the left anterior thalamic radiation as well as the left and right external capsule in, in light blue. Uh, the numbers on here, uh, don't let them scare you. I've put in little icons to show you the, the main results. Um, so here in the first column, we see the seed region of our functional connectivity analysis. So the left anterior superior temporal gyrus is an area in our brain that's very important to our auditory perception. And it's, it's functional connectivity to other auditory perception and visual perception area changes after the opera workshop. Uh, and we also see other regions that are very important to our auditory perception and their functional connectivity to visual areas change after the opera workshop, as well as auditory regions connectivity to regions of our brain that are important for our cognitive functions and our motor uh, and somatosensory systems. <clears throat> our visual and auditory um, areas, as well as um, I've put in a little heart, um, the left amygdala, which is very central to our emotions, and the somatosensory cortex here. Um, and together, this kind of suggests that as part of this opera workshop, the functional connectivity of the auditory and visual, so multi-sensory centers in our brain, the cognitive and somatosensory and emotion centers in our brain 
their communication with each other changes as part of this training, which makes a lot of sense if you think about, again, what is demanded of opera singers as they are on stage. So this was a very first look, and we're hoping to extend this kind of analysis in the future uh, with, a with a longer period of time between our before and after measurements. And um, this data is still being collected, uh, but we're hoping to be done at the end of this year. So maybe in the, in the next year, if we come back, then um, you'll get uh, the bigger overview of what happens when we do these analysis in a, in a greater number of participants. We've already started looking at some of the data from our larger data set, however, and this is what I'll show you next. So uh, remember when I talked about the resting state brain connectivity um, analysis, we did this basically not as here, uh, not as a function of time, so not looking at whether it changes over time, but as a function of musical sophistication. Now, musical sophistication Apologies. Musical sophistication is this concept of musical abilities that extends beyond your ability to play an instrument or sing. So all of us have a certain measure of musical sophistication, even if you may think that you've never learned to play an instrument or you've never had singing training, why would I be musically sophisticated? You are still able to enjoy music. You are still able to and compare different musicians to each other, for example. And so this is all uh, part of this concept of musical sophistication. And so here, what we're looking at is whether the resting state brain connectivity um, kind of correlates with this particular concept. Uh, so here we were specific, uh, specifically focused on different types of um, brain seeds, brain areas, uh, whose um, activity distinguishes between levels of musical expertise and varies during performance of music perception and music production tasks, as well as music imagery tasks. And those areas are often located in sensory areas, in motor areas, and in areas known to integrate signals from different regions, for example, the thalamus or the insula. And as I mentioned, uh, we checked here um, whether this, uh, this brain connectivity of the, these particular areas would vary along this continuum of musical sophistication. Music, uh, the particular concept that we use here is um, uh, caps, uh, cap, encapsulated by this um, construct called the Goldsmith Musical Sophistication Index, which measures five aspects of musical sophistication. So your active engagement, so assessing how much time and money you invest in music and music related activities, perceptual abilities and singing abilities refer to how easily a respondent can perceive music, so hear mistakes or differences between performances, and how well a respondent can sing. And some respondents are highly attuned to the emotions conveyed by music. This is conceptualized um, as the emotions aspect of musical sophistication. And then musical training is what we might typically think of uh, when we talk about musical sophistication. So how much um, time um, uh, and yeah, uh, time and effort was put into training on instruments or in music theory. <clears throat> Another point of interest in our research group is performing arts training in general. So as, is, uh, as we've already heard about opera training, uh, uh, for example. And so interestingly, research on the effects of performing arts other than music, for example, dancing or acting, finds similar results to those that have been reported for the effects of music training, also in sensory motor integrating areas. And so here what we were asking uh, is A, one, how do inter-individual differences in musical sophistication relate to the functional connectivity of the areas? And which modulations in connectivity can be attributed to performing arts training in general? So does it have to be music training specifically, or can it be other types of performing arts training? 
Um, so the 15 regions of interest were based on uh, recent meta-analytic work. And our hypotheses were that the connectivity of sensory areas would vary with the music perceptual abilities aspect of musical sophistication. Um, this is a list of these areas. We also hypothesized that the connectivity of motor areas would vary along with the music training aspect of musical sophistication based on past literature showing such effects. We also hypothesized that the connectivity of integration areas would vary with music training aspect of the musical sophistication index and that the connectivity of all of these areas would differ between those receiving performing arts training and those without. So here we analyze data from 74 participants. Um, there's even more now, but this is where we uh, took stock of um, what was happening in our data. And 37 of these participants were enrolled in performing arts classes at the university level. So those included students from the opera program, but also from the music program. So um, students who were being trained on an instrument as well as drama um, and 37. Um, so the other half of the participants were enrolled in language classes offered at the same university, you guessed it, it's UBC, and from a group of varsity runners also at the university. Uh, so why language and why varsity runners? Um, so we chose to uh, recruit from language classes because those students also receive structured auditory input as part of their university experience. And the varsity runners experience motor sequences um, or are, are trained in motor sequences in the same way as instrumentalists and singers are being trained on motor sequences. So they serve as a good comparison uh, to those other students in the performing arts classes. <coughs> <coughs> and we um, we collected their uh, musical sophistication data along as a, um, uh, alongside a structural um, a structural uh, scan as well as the resting state data. And then we checked whether the gold MSI scores, so, so the musical sophistication scores, uh, related to the the seat to voxel connectivity. And then we looked for between group differences for those enrolled in the performing arts training and those who were not enrolled in performing arts training. And this, so this is a statistical point in case of overlap, then we did post hoc group comparisons with the gold MSI scores entered as a covariate. So to ask basically whether the group differences can really be attributed to inter-individual differences in musical sophistication. What I'm showing here is the spread of musical sophistication values for each scale across our two groups. Uh, in green, we have the group without performing arts training, and in gray, we have the group with training. So what you can see already is the participants in the performing arts training group generally had higher musical sophistication scores, meaning that our analyses are not completely statistically independent of each other. But this is a good sanity check. So you would you would hope that uh, participants who are enrolled in, in music um, would have higher musical sophistication. And so this is what we're showing here. So the connectivity of sensory areas was indeed related to the perceptual abilities subscale of the gold MSI. In addition, and this was very interesting to us, the connectivity of the right superior temporal gyrus, so again, a sensory area um, with voxels situated in the auditory and executive function dedicated areas was related to inter individual differences in the active engagement subscale. As expected, the connectivity of the precentral gyri, so a motor area, uh, was related to inter-individual differences in the training aspect of musical sophistication. And furthermore, we also saw that the connectivity between the seat localized to the left precentral gyrus and clusters localized over uh, the occipital cortex, um, the postcentral gyrus, and the right precentral gyrus. Um, so these are areas associated with vision, um, with somatosensory and motor um, uh, functions that these also were associated with the gold MSI measure assessing emotion. So how um, 
yeah, how 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 much you engage emotionally with music. And the connectivity between the seed localized to the integrative areas and bilateral lingual gyri and the seed localized to the right putamen and the left lingual gyrus were positively associated with a gold MSI measuring um, general musical sophistication. Now I am reporting the results from our analyses on the effects of performing arts training. And so here we found that the connectivity of the posterior superior temporal gyrus, so again, our auditory cortex, as well as the left precentral gyrus, our motor cortex, was different between groups. And also in including those musical sophistication scores as covariates, namely active engagement and general sophistication. So this means really this was an effect of the performing arts training that went above and beyond your, act, your musical sophistication. Uh, so even if you are already very musically sophisticated, then you seek out training, this training will do something else or something additional. So the connectivity of sensory areas was related to music perceptual abilities, as we thought, but also as, as well as active engagement. So the more you actively engage, even without those music perceptual abilities, you seem to be changing or you may be changing the connectivity of your sensory areas. And though the connectivity of the motor areas related to music training, something that you may not be able to actively seek out, the emotions aspect was also important to that connectivity. So the more you emotionally engage with music, it seems that that might change the connectivity of the motor areas. And the connectivity of integrative areas was related to general musical sophistication, but also all other subskills, including singing. And so this may um, point towards a special role of the bilateral putamen for singing abilities, and we're certainly um, very interested in uh, following up this particular result in our full data set once it's ready. Um, the effect of performing arts training were not found for integrative areas. Um, but the effect of performing arts training differed from patterns found for the music training aspect of musical sophistication. This was very interesting. And it points towards particular differences between your past music training. So this is music training that may have happened um, during your childhood and current performing arts training and current music training. Uh, so it may be that your past music training did something and changed something in your brain, but when you're, when you're seeking out music training right now, this does something different to your brain. Um, I should note that here we looked at a whole number of things in our data set. Uh, so this increases uh, um, the possibility of type one error. Um, so to take home from this particular part of our research, the connectivity of sensory, motor, and integrative regions of interest vary with different aspects of musical sophistication, and performing arts training may lead to similar patterns of result, but the effects are independent of each other. So you don't have to already be musically sophisticated. The training itself seems to lead to similar results. And I still have a few minutes, so I want to use them to show you some of our newest results. So uh, from from our future directions. So the overall question, I don't want to lose sight of this big question that we have. Do we see neural signatures of specific types of expertise and training? Why do we even ask this question? By answering this question, we can pinpoint the exact contribution of different types of training, which will hopefully allow us ultimately to provide tailored recommendations for the rehabilitation of different types of brain injury. So what we're currently doing is relating white matter characteristics and auditory cortex anatomy to a continuum of music expertise and along a continuum of language expertise. And afterwards, we want to relate changes in these brain characteristics to specific types of training. And we'll be able to do so with our complete data set. Uh, so here I'm showing you something that we're, what we're currently doing. Uh, what is shown here is an overview um, of participants in our database. Uh, and their cumulative language proficiency. So this is their proficiency in writing, in reading, in, in listening and in speaking language. 
And what you see here is for each participant, their cumulative proficiency. So the higher the bar, the more language proficiency they have. And you'll also see that there are different segments in each of the bars. These different segments stand for different languages in each of that participant's repertoire. So we, on the right here, we have a few participants who are monolingual. And on the left, we have a participant who actually speaks or is proficient in five different languages. So we have this continuum, and as you see, some of the bars are larger or shorter based on their proficiency in that language. And the color or the color difference between different bars refers to the typological difference between, that, between those languages. Uh, so if you've already heard someone speak Dutch, um, you may have thought, wow, that sounds quite similar to English, and that's because there is a typological distance between those two languages so that's actually quite small. Whereas if you've never heard Farsi before as an English speaker, that might sound quite, quite different from English because those two languages have a bigger typological difference. So we're using this particular language distance measure as um, combined with a proficiency measure to check whether language expertise relates to um, particular uh, particular aspect uh, so the fa or the or the volume of the arcuate fasciculus uh, the white matter tract that i pointed out earlier which connects the auditory cortex with the inferior frontal gyrus which is a part of our brain that's really important uh, for understanding structure across time. So certainly language and music are both auditory stimuli that are structured in time. And so we're comparing whether this particular measure of language proficiency and the musical sophistication measures that I showed you earlier um, may be able to explain how that arcuate fasciculus looks like um, in our participants. Uh, so here I'm showing you brand new results, and what we're showing here is that the more um, people, uh, the more our participants score on, on, on the subscale of musical training in our musical sophistication score, the more we see asymmetry in the dorsal arcuate fasciculus. Um, I've made some extra notes on here. So the higher the point is to, um, on the y-axis, the more we see leftward, uh, 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 leftward volume, meaning the left arcuate fasciculus is larger than the right uh, arcuate fasciculus. And the more a point trends towards um, the lower part of this uh, y-axis, the more uh, the right arcuate fasciculus is larger than the left arcuate fasciculus. So here we're looking at hemispheric asymmetry. And what we're seeing here is that the more musically trained you are, according to the musical sophistication score, the more you seem to show this rightward volume asymmetry. So you're basically focusing the neuroplastic effects may be happening in the right hemisphere, uh, so in the right arcuate fasciculus. And this fits really well with some of the results we've already seen in the literature showing that music may be a more right hemispheric um, or a right hemisphere uh, supported function. Um, what I'm showing you here is a particular view of the um, auditory cortex, which we are using also uh, to check for effects on the, uh, on the anatomical uh, characteristics of the auditory cortex. I'm showing you a real brain here. Uh, so this is my brain, which, uh, so this is why I know I am allowed to show this particular brain. Um, and what I'm, what I'm showing you here is the output of a particular um, analysis that looks at the shape of the Heschel's gyrus. The Heschel's gyrus is a part of our auditory cortex, also known as the first cortical station um, that is reached by sound. So when we're listening to things, uh, this signal travels through our ears, through our lower brain regions, and then to our cortex. And the first part that it reaches is the Heschel's gyrus. And the Heschel's gyrus um, is a special name for what is what we call anatomically the transverse temporal gyrus. And more commonly, we think that this gyrus or 
uh, most commonly, this uh, gyrus is thought of as a single gyrus. But we're, what we're seeing here, and so this is apparently what's in my left, uh, left hemisphere, is that this gyrus that we usually see um, being a singular gyrus is actually something that looks like a gyrus that is in the process of duplicating itself. This is called a common stem duplication. And what others have shown is that music training seems to lead to a higher likelihood for a common stem duplication of the first transverse temporal gyrus. And this is something we want to corroborate in our own data. Um, and uh, so I wanted to show this to you here um, to give you a flavor of what my day to day life looks like. I look at a lot of prints and then I, I see whether I see these common stem duplications or not. Um, and so once we've analyzed all of our data, again, we hope to see what the neural signatures are of specific types of expertise and training. Um, I think I've taken up a lot of your time already. Um, I would like to make sure to thank Anna Ivkov, Grace Hu, Francesca Corrado, and Minty Hu, uh, who also helped collect this data. Um, this research was very generously funded by the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of British Columbia. Um, when I was in Vancouver, I was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and uh, Sarah Kreitner is currently being funded by NSERC. During the talk, you've seen small numbers on my slides. These refer to references um, where that influence our research. Uh, and that's it from me. Thank you so much for your attention. And I've seen many questions in the chat, so I hope I guess I have some time to answer them. Perfect. Thank you, Anya, and also Dr. Boyd for sharing all of your expertise. And also, it was just really interesting to see um, the very recent kind of update on the research. So um, that was very cool information. Uh, with that, we'll, we'll move on to the Q&A session. Um, so if any of you have questions for either one of our speakers today, uh, feel free to put it in the chat and then uh, we'll be able to go through to answer them. Um, and then I'm just looking at some of the questions from earlier on um, in the meantime. Uh, so the first question we have is that most of the presentation has kind of had the focus on uh, people with musical training or people going through the musical training. How much of this positive effects um, apply to those who just listen to music or more of like an entertainment style? Um, do, do you, you want, want to, to go, go Laura? <laughs> oh, I mean, I can, but so our study, we don't know from the data we've collected. So, so the data we're working on were very purposely designed to study the UBC students who are engaging in these complicated performances. Um, however, the, some of the literature that I reviewed early on suggests that even musical listening can have these profound effects and musical training also can have these effects. Um, and so you may not have to, like I, I probably should never be in an opera for lots of reasons, <laughs> but I, I may still be able to benefit from some degree of musical training and certainly from listening uh, to music itself. So that's kind of, I think where the where the science is, but I don't know, Anya, you might know a little bit more, you are in the capital of the performing arts in the world, really, I might say in Vienna. So what do you think? Yeah. Um, so I should also mention, so that in the middle part of my talk, I was talking about musical sophistication, which does not actually refer to your degree of actual music training, but also about different ways in which people relate to music. Um, so we see these effects in participants who are not musically trained but who just have this emotional engagement with music. So certainly if you enjoy listening to music a lot, that is probably telling me that you are emotionally engaged with that music. And so we seem to see similar effects um, in our data in those who are particularly emotionally invested in music compared to participants who are actually getting that music training. So music training is doing something, but just emotionally engaging with music is also doing something. And they seem to be doing similar things. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I guess then the second question might also be a still um area that you're still um trying to discover. But are there any kind of differences in these positive outcomes of music based on the age they start to take part in um, music activity? Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a very interesting question and something that's been investigated a lot in, in different types of data sets, I would say. Um, so opera students are actually very special in the music training literature. Uh, and that's because um, I'm sure you, you've probably heard of musical prodigies and at that age they must have started to become so proficient in their, um, in, on their instrument. And for example, I started playing the piano when I was five, quite young, before I knew how to read and write. Um, but uh, opera students actually start fairly late in their training. And that's because the, the human voice uh, matures uh, through their teenage, through the teenage years. And so um, to, in order to become an opera student, you basically have to wait until your voice is adult before you can really get trained on that instrument. And so we have in our data set um, this very special group of participants who are getting training, a very specialized training, fairly late compared to other types of musicians. Um, so the age certainly seems to play a role in the data sets that um, exist out there, uh, but we are able to show, hopefully, um, that a late start doesn't mean that there's no effects. Okay, perfect. Good to know. Yeah, I'm not personally, um, I didn't grow up with music, so it's good to know that I can still, it's never too late. It's, it is never too late, truly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I also had one question. Um, when you were talking about just the differences in pattern um, between music um, and then other performing arts, I couldn't quite get like what the specific differences were. Like, did you were you able to highlight certain areas that were different, or was it just like a general pattern difference? Yeah, it was. Uh, so, uh, what we're showing there is differences between uh, performing arts training in general. Uh, in the pattern and the musical training scale of the musical sophistication um, concept. So this is a very important difference. It's not showing that the performing arts training in general is different from music training. It's showing that the performing arts training, current performing arts training is different from past music training. Mm -hmm. So um, we hopefully will be able to answer this type of question with more confidence once our full data set is available, uh, because then we will actually have a group of participants who've done opera training, a group of participants who've done instrument training, and a group of participants who've done acting training, uh, rather than at the moment where we, we have participants who are currently engaging in different types of training, um, and the group sizes are different at the moment. Uh, so. This is a this is a question I would like to delay answering until we have the full data set. Right. OK, thank you. Uh, we did get one question from the participant just now. Uh, does the kind of music you listen to affect us differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I, I live in Vienna, uh, the capital of classical music, and certainly I think all of my neighbors would like to tell you that it is only the Viennese music that is the best, but I think that's just not true. It's a lie. Um, and what we know from the body of literature is that the music that's best for you is the music that you like best. And so it is really the music that you like best. Certainly there are certain aspects uh, that you might consider, for example, very loud music is bad for your hearing. So in that sense, if you like very loud music, that's awesome. Just maybe listen to it not that loudly. Um, but basically, the music that is best for you is the music that you like best. Perfect. Great. Thank you for that. Um, seems like uh, there's no more questions and now we're getting closer to our end time. So I think we'll start wrapping up the presentation for today's event. So thank you again for both um, Dr. Boy and Dr. Kree for sharing about music and various impact on the brain and health in general. Um, and all of you for joining us today as well.
Um, and thank you for joining. Um, and hopefully we get to see you in next month's uh, Wellness Wednesday series, which will be at the beginning of January. Thank you.